Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of CSUN Performance Ensemble Presents A Conversation With. My name is Jefferson Denham, and I'm one of your co-hosts. And I'm the other co-host who's very sleepy, Fernando Martinez. And we're going we're gonna to wake him up. We're going to wake him up with our energy that's going to come from me and our conversation with our awesome guest today, Mr. William Booz. Now, William, the first question, before, right off the bat, how do I say your last name? Oh, great question. So it's pronounced Bose, like the speakers. Bose, because I want to say booze, but you can tell that's what's on my mind. Okay, <laughs> okay William Bose. And uh, because we ask all of our guests, how, what pronouns do you prefer? Oh, love this question. My pronouns are he, him, his. Okay, great, because we always want to be respectful. So um, if you've watched any of our previous episodes, you know this, but I'm going to state it anyway. Fernando and I are big believers in the idea that our life experiences, well, they certainly influence our lives, but they also inform our art and how it, and, and it's cool to see how it manifests itself in our day-to-day -day life. So we're fascinated by life journeys. And so, um, William, our conversation today is going to be divided up into three parts, three acts, if you will. Oh, love. Okay, so act one will be birth from the moment you popped out through through middle school ripped through the <laughs> ta da and then <laughs> act two will be middle school through college okay and then act three we're going to focus primarily on your performance ensemble experience mm -hmm. after all that's the focus the point of this so and we may do an addendum too just to see where is he now after graduation uh all that sound good totally yeah all right william bows here we go um when and where, act one, when and where were you born? Yeah, so I was born in October of 92. My parents had me at Bellevue Overlake Hospital in Bellevue, Washington. I'm a born and raised Pacific Northwestern native. Um, I actually came back to Washington after I did many a journey for college and undergrad. So Washington is home. Um, I, my parents still live in the same house that I was born in, not born in, I was born in the hospital, but uh, <laughs> the same house that I was raised in, grew up in. Um, it's, it's seen a lot. <laughs> I'm sure if those walls could talk, they would have their own stories and their own uh, moments <laughs> that they wish. Well, then we'll, let, we'll let you speak for the walls then, Shepard. <laughs> <laughs> so um, tell, us, tell us about uh, your parents. I mean, growing up in uh, the Northwest, yeah. Uh, what What are your parents like, and what was your relationship like with them? So I'm one of two, so I have an older sister. She's technically my half sister, but I was never raised to think that way or raised to believe that way. Um, when my mom had just gotten out of high school, she ended up she was dating a guy. They were engaged. She was pregnant, and then the guy kind of was like. It was, it was going to be their rehearsal dinner. And he was like, mm, like, why don't we like move the date? And she was like, what? <laughs> like, no, like, what, what do you, this is done. And he's like, whoa, what? She's like, I don't, like, if you think that you like need to take more time to like think about this, or you're not sure that you like want to be a dad, I don't want to be married to you. So she just single mommed it. Like she moved back in with her parents. She had my sister and she just raised my sister on her own till she met my dad. Um, growing up, my dad never really imagined himself being a father, but he fell in love with my mom. Although, <laughs> side note for them, on their first date, she told my dad that he wasn't worth more than 50 cents. <laughs> Burn, dad. But they just fell in love and then my dad adopted officially adopted my sister um there's a really cute story that when they went to the judge the judge asked amber she was oh gosh three maybe four years old i don't remember the exact age and he asked her straight up you know he was like do you want this man to be your dad and she looked at the judge and lo looked at my dad and she like nodded her head and said yes and so like oh like what a moment that must have been to just feel that you know this daughter that you know quote isn't biologically yours truly though does want you to be her father so growing up, I felt very loved and cared for by my parents. Um, they were very nurturing, very giving. My dad worked full time. My mom was a full time mom. So one of the hardest jobs in the world to do. But she raised my sister and I uh, 
we were like a really close-knit family. You know, we did the camping trips, um, one that ended up with my sister getting lice, and then they had to like de-louse her, then came out to find out that it wasn't lice, it was just paint, <laughs> and so no idea. Um, <laughs> We fire had, that doctor. I, it was like what? Like, <laughs> but my parents like were looking at you know at her head and they're like, well, there are like you know little, little white spots. So sitting there like watching the hot dogs boil, my sister's like crying. It's like you know they're combing out her hair, and I was you know just eating my hot dog. I was like, whatever. <laughs> just don't get any over here. I'm, yeah, I'm right. Gonna say. Like, mm, no. Um, <laughs> but yeah, growing up, I mean, my parents were very very caring. They definitely took a lot of interest in like my sister and I, their whole belief was, you know, if you have interests, like we want to, you know, push those, allow you to pursue those. Um, as my sister and I got older, I found myself sort of more interested in like the outdoors, not really like a sports person. So a neighbor of mine, Ian, he ended up inviting me to a Cub Scout meeting. And then I got hooked on Cub Scouts, later became a Boy Scout. Um, and then my parents like were very involved, like growing up. Um, did I you, even, like, I'm sorry, did, did you Eagle Scout? Did you Eagle? I did Eagle. I made it all the way Check to Check you Scout. out, you badass. Keep going. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. No worries at all. Um, but growing up, I mean, my dad was like super involved in like the Pinewood Derby. We would do the uh, uh, rockets together. So you'd make them with like two liter bottles of soda and then you would like put like an egg in there and then you would launch it up and uh, my mom got very involved. She would take like leadership positions in the pack, later the troop. Um, she would go to like the meetings, do all of, like, you know, the, the activities and all that kind of stuff. So parents were very involved growing up. And then it really wasn't until we kind of hit a snag in the whole family dynamic. Um, we'll, we'll deep dive into it later, but okay. my sister is now a recovered poly substance abuser um, started when she was very young so my parents one time caught her like just drinking wine out of the fridge at like eight nine um, and then really hit like really got into drugs like 13 14 and I grew up in a rich white suburbia <laughs> hated it um, the Sammamish plateau I literally lived on a plateau gross um, there was little to no diversity there growing up. Like you had, you know, the, the, the token black kid in school or like, you know, the one Latino family that was there. And it, it always, I think, kind of amazed me when I actually got out of Sammamish later that like, oh, wow, like Sammamish is hella freaking white. And yikes, like it... It, I am so privileged to have gotten like the education that I got, to have gotten the access to resources that I got to do things like Boy Scouts and, um, you know, make it all the way up to an Eagle Scout and have a family that was able to provide me those opportunities. But it, it really became very obvious later on in life how, how much like you miss out on opportunities by not having like a diverse population that you grow up in. And I was so fortunate to go to a place like CSUN because it exposed me to a primarily, you know, non-white community. And it was incredible to both like feel for once like a minority, but also to like fully embrace that minority status and be like, yeah, like white people kind of are the worst. Not even kind of. You know what? I, I'm going to pause you there because we will get into that more deeply when we talk about your college experience. But I love that you shared all that. And there's two things, William, I want to just harken this trickle back to one is um and what i love about your sh what you're sharing is i think and tell me if you agree i think sometimes people have like a cliche notion in their head that oh that person's on drugs because it's a horrible home situation and yeah. it, of course it's going to lead to that kind of thing right um but that is not what you're telling us you're telling us that here's normal affluent and if it's a tendency in you it's gonna happen, you know what I mean? So just uh, based on what you, you're saying, and Fernando, tell me if you agree too, sometimes people who, with, who are not privileged, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second, uh, they say, well, they just are, you know, that, that they're just reacting to their environment, and you know, so that's why they're always gonna be criminals or whatever. 
Uh, does that resonate with what you've experienced? It really does. So Sammamish has a very high drug use young population. We literally had an FBI bust, not even kidding. You can Google it. There was the Papa John's in Sammamish that it was Operation Black Olive. Um, you would walk in, you would place a, an order a very specific way, and then they would walk out with a pizza box and it would just be like full of drugs. And it, it always like amazed me how like growing up, I really wasn't paying so much attention. I mean, like you knew like certain kids did drugs, but then you also really didn't think that it was like hard drugs. You would maybe assume like weed, drinking, but like these kids were doing like cocaine. It wouldn't shock me if others, you know, were doing heavier things like my sister was like meth or heroin. So this was prevalent all around you, but you weren't necessarily uh, aware of it, you're saying, or you just didn't think that was as bad as it was? I, I definitely knew that like it happened. I think it was more like I was so entrenched in like what my family was dealing with because my sister started so young and my parents did so much to try and keep that away from me. So they really did a lot to make sure that I wasn't overexposed to it. But I have a very distinct memory of I was still in grade school. I was down downstairs watching Scooby-Doo my dad, I heard my dad leave to go pick up my sister from like a friend's house. She was in junior high at this point. Comes back and she's crying and like my dad's yelling. And that wasn't like out of the ordinary. Like, you know, my, my parents, my sister started fighting a lot. And this, you know, little happy family that I remembered, you know, really wasn't around anymore. It was always yelling, my, you know, parents slamming things around my sister always kind of coming and going, always getting into trouble, always getting punished. I would be like up in my bedroom, you know, trying to do homework or play with my toys. And then, you know, I'd hear my parents like shouting with my sister at the kitchen table. And it was just like, okay, great. Like I'm gonna play with like my little Digimon figure, right? Right, I'm gonna go sequester myself over here and stay away from the all the angst and all the drama. Angst, all the noise, all the drama, but I remember all of a sudden my sister's yelling, changing to like screaming, like blood curdling screaming. And I just, it was, it was almost like out of, out of a movie and a very out of body experience where I remember slowly climbing up the stairs. I turned and there's the second staircase to like the upper floor with, which was just the bedrooms and the, and the bathroom. I remember like my mom, like running out of her, my, my sister's bedroom into her bedroom and my dad screaming to call 911. And I remember climbing up the stairs and turning into my sister's room and watching her like face down, screaming into her bed, pounding her fist. And my dad just like looks at me. He's like, get the F out of here. And I do, I ran all the way down and on our bottom floor, we had this sliding glass window that looked out into our uh, backyard. And I remember just dropping to my knees and just praying to God, I was like, I was like, take me instead, you know, like kill me, save wow. my sister. Um, you William, know. how old How old were you? I was that? probably like eight or nine. I and how old was Amber? Oh gosh, 14, I would say around that age. Yeah, wow, so I was bro. like fifth, fifth, maybe sixth grade. Definitely, I think closer to fifth grade. Um, and, we, and all of us were raised Catholic. I was baptized in the Catholic church. My sister was also, um, my parents were like heavily involved in the church and uh, I just, like, that was just something that I didn't even, like, think about. I just remember, like, I need to pray to God, and I need my sister to be alive, and if that means that, you know, I have to sacrifice, like, myself, like, that, that's okay, because it really matters to me that, like, my sister is alive. Wow. Now, are you oh, and Amber close now? Oh, yeah. We're, we're a lot closer now. Because um, before, she, I'm sure she, you know, you're that age gap anyway, right? My yeah. kid brother. But then also she's going through such upheaval. Like yes, you guys, remember, does she talk about these things now with you? Do you are you able to kind of hash these things out together? She does and she doesn't. So it ended up being, huh. so from that time up until four years ago, she was an addict, like wasn't in my life or she would be and then she would disappear. She would come back to get money and then disappear. Um, like her entire journey was like terrible. 
Um, she and your was, parents, I mean, the heartache your parents went through. Oh yeah, so it, uh, it, was, it was a long time of just bad, like just at, at home with my family, for my sister especially. Like I remember like the, the paramedics came, took her to the hospital. I remember the police officers standing in my sister's bedroom. I was now allowed to be up there because obviously there were people in our house. Um, and they, you know, told my parents to like, you know, strip her room to search everything. Like nothing should be unturned. And my parents definitely like started doing that. And so we, when we went to the hospital, I remember I took Little Town on the Prairie with me and my Winnie the Pooh pillow. It had Winnie the Pooh on one side and Tigger on the other. Right. And we were just sitting in the waiting room for hours and hours as my sister detoxed really wow. down from her high. So this is, I love, not love, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful, I should say, that you're being so open and honest with oh, yeah. these kinds of things because, you know, a lot of these things can be hidden. A lot of these things people can be ashamed to talk about. And I think by bringing them out into the open and shining a light on them, that's how you can, well, you get permission for some other people to share as well. And that's only, yeah. I think truth is the only place to start for healing. So, well, let me, let me awkwardly segue out of what you've just told us as a backdrop, which is profound. Yeah. And let's talk about school, because I know that this is now going to permeate probably your school experience. Uh, where did you go to school? Let's just say elementary school, middle school, and high school. Let's start with elementary school. Where did you go to school? Elementary school, I went to Margaret Mead Elementary. I went there from kindergarten all the way to sixth grade. So we had sort of like a weird system here where it was kindergarten to sixth. Then my junior high was Inglewood Junior High School, seventh to ninth. And then our high Eighth school, East Lake okay. High School, was 10 to 12, which okay. was not very common. When I, when I went to California, I heard that like schools were like your traditional um, like middle school, high school, and elementary. And I was like... Oh, that's like so weird because this was totally it's so different from what you're used to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so did you like school? Oh, my God. I loved school. Like, Why? Ever since kindergarten. <laughs> Why? Was, well, my Hogwarts house is Ravenclaw. So I'm definitely that nerd, that intellectual where Fernando's raising his hand. Yes, uh, do we, do we uh, date the Ravenclaw? No, 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 I have a question. This is, so this oh. is, the, the thing is like, I, I don't know how to insert myself. So I raise my hand, right? Oh um, what is, what, what's Ravenclaw? I don't know what that, I watched 10 minutes of Harry Potter and I did because I couldn't. Fernando, you were the only person, no, I, I, I was just gonna <laughs> shame you, but it's so wrong of me to w watch this episode and not know this, but I'm so glad you asked because maybe there's others who wonder too. Go yeah. ahead. What's Ravenclaw? I don't know. So in the Harry Potter universe, written by a person, it is, <laughs> <laughs> got her. Um, it is a Hogwarts house. So in the Harry Potter universe, when you go to Hogwarts, there's four houses, Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin. Ravenclaw is the bronze eagle with the blue background. It's meant for students who are traditionally more intellectual. That's sort of the trait that they focus on. Um, Gryffindor is really like courage, bravery, Hufflepuff, loyalty, Slytherin, ambition. And for me, that really kind of just came from, like, I did. I love school. I always had a very large group of friends at school. I just loved to learn, and I loved feeling challenged. I always felt that there was just something to do at school. There is something to be said about the routine of school and how it helps to sort of create a series of tasks that you kind of do every day. And mm. I always found myself being challenged at school. I mean, I wasn't like an A plus student, definitely in like that, that B range. Um, I was always just sort of like average at school, but I really enjoyed school. Do you and feel like, I'm sorry to interrupt you, William, do you yeah. feel like school part of the uh, joy was escaping from the drama at home? So then later, yes, once my family sort of shifted, it really became a place of escape. I, I no longer was surrounded by people screaming and fighting all the time. I got to be sort of 
like more myself. And I actually felt that I was like seen. I was definitely a teacher's pet. I always got real chummy with all my teachers um, from grade school all the way up into grad school. Like I always felt that if you had a good relationship with your teacher, one, you got away with more. Two, they would usually, you know, be a little bit more forgiving if you forgot your homework or if you like didn't you know finish your test yet <laughs> okay so audience if you are still in school take these words to heart william says that they work hey by the way where did you sit in the classroom i have a theory where was you where did you sit so at my school everybody had assigned seats so well oh. up into east like so we, we really didn't get a choice where to sit um but in college when you, it was open seating i didn't sit front row i would sit like two or three rows back just because it's like, I'm not like a super try hard, but like the teacher will like still see my face so that if I ever came during office hours or had questions, they would remember me and be like, oh, I know you, especially in like a 400 person lecture, it's hard to get noticed. But if right. you need that help, it's, it's worthwhile to just make that effort. I uh, think that's great advice actually in general. So do you have any memories that stand out for, let's just stay with elementary school. Is there a story that you could tell us that would typify your experience in elementary school? So, yes. <laughs> in the We didn't form, rehearse this, people. We did not <laughs> rehearse this. Um, it's just, it's one of the most uh, William-like stories of my school experience. So, in the fourth grade, I had um, two best friends, Ian and Emma Walsh, and they lived like four houses up from me. And Ian I, and Emma, so were they twins? They were not twins. Ian was an older brother. He was two years older than Emma and I, but Emma and I were in the um, same kindergarten class and we went through school all together. So from K to graduation in 12th grade. And like, I grew up at their house. I like lived at their house, especially during those bad years. And Ian used to do patrol. So you kind of got to, you know, like be like a crossing guard for the students. But at the end of the year, you got to go to Wild Wave, which is so much fun. So you couldn't be a crossing guard until fourth grade. But Wild Wave is what? A water park or it's a, something? It's a, it's a water theme park up here. It's the, the place. If you're living in the Northwest, you know what I, I needed oh, clarification. Yeah. So go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, right. So it was after school. Emma and I were waiting for Ian and we were playing on the, the big purple slide toy, which is now been torn down which is so sad but we were on the rings emma and i were like very avid ring goers so you would uh swing between and kind of like grab the hanging rings so when ian got off patrol he came over and we were all kind of just like goofing around and ian was like swinging on a pair of them and like let's go and like does this like cool flip i remember and then like lands and being sort of the the luigi to ian's mario um <laughs> If well, because we were like, you know, big Nintendo guys, um, I often tried to copy him. So here I am swinging. And <laughs> as I try to go, I end up hitting my head on the overhead beam. So I let go of the rings and I, and I fall to the ground. Well, you're a little ways up in the air. So I put my hands out to catch myself and <laughs> so I fracture both of my wrists at the same time. Oh. Man, I start screaming. Like, I mean, obviously, I just fractured both of my wrists. Like, it hurt. All of all of like the kids that were at at the playground, just like stop and like watching me as I'm like sitting there, you know, with like my two limp wrists, <laughs> foreshadowing. And later, <laughs> they were, um, teachers come out. I do though remember this older student. He was like, you know, a sixth grader. He was like, he's just faking it. He's fine. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so, um, right, uh, Miss Cameron, who was later my sixth grade math teacher, she came out, um, helped take me to the, to the nurse's station. They looked, they were like, he needs to go to the hospital. So they, <laughs> they call my mom. She comes and picks me up. We go to the doctors. They do x-rays. They're like, yeah, he fractured both of them. So they cast me up. So I had, I came home, double casted, one was bright neon green, the other was a bright blue. And school the next day was rough because I show up being like, hey guys. <laughs> and everyone was like, I wanna know what the guy said who thought you were faking it. You should have walked oh. right up to him and say, faking it, eh? 
So funny enough, later I had eventually like gotten like my cast off, but I went into the into the uh, boys restroom and he was in there with like some friend probably, you know, skipping class or just, you know, goofing off. And he remembers my face. Of course he does. And he's like, oh, like watch this. And you know, like falls and starts like doing push-ups. And he's like, it's not like that hard. And I remember just like awkwardly being like, neat like okay cool like one that's not as far as i fell two you weren't unexpectedly you know jostled by hitting your head and just falling like you caught yourself that's totally different um thought all these things but i was just like uh -huh, and like walked to the other boys room but i was just like one who does that like who insults somebody who breaks their bones but Clearly, he had a lot of stuff to work out. As a well, you know what? I, I just I just got this this just in. That guy's in jail right now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, he, wouldn't <laughs> he was just like one of those typical school bullies that just yep. had to make sure that people knew that he was strong and cool and edgy and angsty. And I just don't and insecure with yeah, a small like penis. Insecure about it, and just like felt the need to like <laughs> belittle some poor little fourth. I know, and, like, I know. I'll tell you what, man. I, and, and so let, the, here's another awkward segue, because usually those kind of things happen. They did for me, and I'm about Fernando, but those things usually happen in middle school. They certainly did for me, like I said, but that happened early. So now you're kind of like, okay, I know that. I've seen that. Uh, now, middle school, like you said, for you is uh, uh, grades seven, eight, and nine. Yep. Seven, eight, and nine. So talk to us about uh, middle school. How was that? Was it, was it okay? Was it challenging? What was it like? Middle school, back then, I consider it to be both some of like the best years of like my schooling experience, as well as like some of the worst. So by seventh grade, I had already started growing body hair. So I hit puberty a little young. Um, I remember I had full braces. I had really nerdy, you know, small wireframe glasses. Uh, I, my voice cracked a lot. I had a higher pitched voice. So kids are now older and kids are now a little bit meaner. It was very quickly established that I was gay. People would taunt me, people would make fun of me, but I also had a really good group of friends. So I remember taking um, like LASS with Mrs. Bafis. I took Food, Clothes, and You um, with Mrs. Oh, was it Morris? Could have been Moorhead. Anyway. Uh, Make sure you I, tell all your favorite teachers to watch this episode. They're going to love right? that you're name dropping them even after all these years. That's great. But I also remember it being like so fun to be in seventh grade because every subject had a different teacher, which I loved versus just, you know, the same teacher for all subjects that you took in in grade school and I just loved going between them I loved how I was exposed to you know multiple groups of kids so they sort of like you take all the different grade schools and then you throw them on into a junior high together so it was now finally being exposed to, to students that I'd never met before and I was you know nerdy and geeky but I really had a good group of friends from Margaret Mead that I carried with me into Inglewood but then we really started to, to grow our group of friends so we, our, our meeting spot, classic, was the library. So we would meet every morning. So Ravenclaw of you. So Ravenclaw, right? <laughs> we would all like stand together and, you know, talk and catch up. And then we'd all break off into our classes. Um, but at that point, my sister was, was like really struggling, was like really having a lot of issues that were now beginning to like affect me. So it wasn't that I was super um uninvolved like now it, it was starting to like affect my schooling um and that's something that i like began to reflect on later in life was it, it it did like i mean my home life was really chaotic and so it wasn't like i had a peaceful place to study or was you know able to get help on homework and it it definitely like affected my grades at some point i mean i still you know carried through and got you know a's and b's certain subjects you know you'd get like a c here and there and then you'd have that awkward conversation with like your parents was this the best you, you could do? And it was like, no, I guess I could have done better. I could have studied harder. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the subjects that I was really good at shifted. I used to be great at math. And by ninth grade, I was no longer great at math. Also because Mr. Chandler screwed me over. So I took- Mr. Chandler, grade. if you're watching, he's gotten over it. He, he's forgiven you. <laughs> 
Well, only, <laughs> only because he made a terrible decision. So in eighth grade, it's kind of like pre-algebra. And if you've ever taken math, algebra is the most important math class you could ever take. Well, he had me skip algebra and I went right into geometry. And geometry, there's like a little bit of algebra, but like not a lot. So I never took algebra, ever. So I, I was never trained oh. how to do algebra. And so when I went into 10th grade and did advanced algebra, no idea, like big old D on that, that report card. It was, it was ugh. also I hated Mr. Stratton, who was my- By the way, you know what they say at college though? Ds get degrees. And I shouldn't I have said that. I anyway, hella degrees. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so uh, let me just pause you because we're going to now get into high school. You just said, you know. Oh, like, so we can we can like back it up. Um, okay, good, good, and we will. But I want to ask you this: When did you first fall in love? <sighs> so I. It's a really good question. One, because I don't think that I actually fell in love in, in like my schooling experience. I had girlfriends um, and, I, and I definitely dated uh, during those years. But I think because like being a, a gay queer man now, I don't consider the fact that I dated women and even though like I, I cared about those women a lot, I don't believe that I was actually in love with them. And so it really wasn't until after those years that I actually fall in love. And it really wasn't until a couple years ago that I had my first official boyfriend that I actually feel that I like truly like fell in love. Um, so we'll say 24. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, th let me, that just opens up another line of questioning if you don't mind me asking. So no, when in middle school people were saying, oh, you're gay and they're, they're trying to you know, put you down. And of course in middle school, we're all terrified and we all want to fit in. and. Uh, did you think, okay, I really am, and they found me out? Or did you go, am I? Or how, what was your reaction to that? So we're going to get deep. When I was 13 years old and these taunts really started, I had a lot of questions. The first being, like, what is gay? So I was this, like, nerdy kid. I watched Pokemon, Digimon, Dragon Ball Z. I, I, I played Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Like, I... You know, wasn't watching Adult Swim and Family Guy and American Dad. And so I, you know, didn't watch like R-rated movies at the age of 12. So I was sort of like a little bit of like a sheltered kid. Again, like, remind, like you know, I was Catholic. I was in Scouts. Um, you know, I really did like school. And I didn't really have a lot of guy friends growing up. I mean, like aside from Ian, I really didn't have a lot of just friends that were guys. And especially when I got into seventh grade, a lot of the guy friends that I did have you know, now they were in school with like, you know, their soccer, you know, teammates and their baseball teammates. And so they really kind of dropped me. Um, so when I was 13 years old, I started, you know, I turned to the, the place that we all do, the internet, and just started researching and trying to, you know, figure it out. And that led me to, at the time, um, gay dating websites. And I had like a lot of questions because it was continuously being taunted at me. And so I made like a fake account and started chatting with a guy and he basically told me that he could help me answer those questions and help me, you know, really know if I was gay. So at the age of 13, I told my parents that I needed to go to the library, which is like a mile away from my house. Fernando. Sorry, uh, this is for anybody listening. If, um, if there's a trigger warning, we should put one, right? Yes, so trigger warning, sexual assault, um, sexual assault of a minor, PPS. Good catch, Fernando. Yeah, sorry. Um, no, 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 don't apologize at all. Um, you may be sleepy, but you are paying attention. <laughs> Nicely done, Fernando. <laughs> yeah. So I walked to the library and waited for Rick to arrive. So when Rick pulled up in his black car, um, tinted windows, he got out of the car and could easily have passed for like an older dad or at least like a younger grandfather. Yeah, so older 40s, early 50s, we'll say. And I'm very obviously a 13 year old. <clears throat> he and I sit on the curb and we just kind of talk and he starts asking me questions. And he basically says that he can help me know for sure. 
And so I get into his car with him, you know, all like, you know, stranger danger is like, you know, ringing in my head. I have brought my pocket knife with me just in case because who knows like what that's actually going to do. But here we are. And I perform oral sex on him. He performs oral sex on me and I get out of the car and he leaves. And I all of a sudden just now had so many follow-up questions like you know I you know ended up like ejaculating and so it was like does that mean that I'm into it and you know I was hard at, you know the whole time so does it mean that I like boys but I've never liked boys I've only ever liked girls and I've only ever you know tried to kiss girls and so like like what just happened and so I, I walk home and it was a fall day and I get I get home and my mom's making spaghetti and she was like, you know, how was, how was the library? Oh, and also note, um, the reason why I picked the library was because it usually has a ton of people there. The library was closed that day. So there was nobody else there, no one else around. Rough. So when I got home, I was like, yep, I got, I got my, my book returned. Um, when's dinner gonna be? And she's like, oh, it'll be, you know, in like half hour. And I just go up to my room and I just sat there. And then I went down for dinner and then I went to school the next day and somebody, of course, calls me gay. And I now, I now didn't know if what they were asking, you know, or saying or taunting me about was real or not. So then I met Rick again and again and again. And he started buying me Yukio cards as little presents and as little gifts. And then one time, um, you know, like we walked into Tully's together and one of like my mom's friends walked in and saw me sitting with this older guy. And then my mom brought it up to me later and I didn't, I didn't say anything. Um, I was like, oh, you know, like, yeah, he just like needed help with like his laptop. And so I was showing him how to like connect to like, you know, the, the Wi-Fi or something. Um, she was like, oh, okay. Um, and then eventually I stopped seeing Rick. But then Rick became Nick. And then Nick became Steve up by the lake. And then Steve up by the lake. And so then it became a really long list of men who took advantage of me and took advantage of my, one, my youth, two, the fact that I was naive and had no idea what was happening. When I ended up telling my family about what Rick had done to me, nothing happened. I got grounded for three weeks. My entire winter break was ruined <laughs> that year. Um, and I remember my sister, when, when my parents gave me my punishment and I looked up and my sister was looking at me like it was so justified. Like she was so happy and just like this like malicious grin on her face that I was finally getting, like I was finally the one getting punished. It wasn't her. And growing up, my sister oftentimes thought that I was more loved, that I got better things, that she was, you know, like the disappointment of the family. But I basically told my parents that I had been molested and raped. I, I literally handed them Rick's address because he had left it on one of the packages that he gave me of, of Yu-Gi-Oh cards and nothing happened. Um, later heard that like, you know, my parent, like my dad did like a lot of soul searching of like, do I need to drive to this like motherfucker? So sorry. Oh my God. Oh, you're good. Drive oh we speak French. Guy? Okay, great. Um, do I have to drive to this guy's house and like kill him? Cause I want to, right? Like it, it was so difficult because I also told them multiple times throughout my middle school and high school years that I had, you know, made a mistake. And I had, you know, relapsed because, right, I existed in this world where, like, you know, my sister was like a drug addict or that I had, you know, fallen off the beaten path again and met up with somebody again. And every single time it was just like a, a similar punishment. It was you're grounded, no electronics. Um, but on the outside, right, you know, I was, right, I was, you know, climbing the ranks in scouts. I was still bringing home A's and B's. I eventually joined drama and, you know, was like the drama star. And I, on the outside, everything was fine. And every single time that I came home, I wasn't covered in bruises. I wasn't beaten up. I came home fine. And that, I think, especially as like a parent, like you, 
my parents described it to me as like, you know, we basically had to look at, at, at you and your sister and we had to kind of like make a choice, you know, who needed us more. And my sister was falling deeper and deeper in, into drugs, you know, failing school, skipping school, you know, it, they basically kind of made a choice that like, you know, our daughter needs us and our son is fine. Yes, is he making bad choices? Sure. But he still comes home and he's still okay. And, you know, it, it, it was basically like still having a family, but being abandoned by my entire family. So and I didn't big. really have a sister because she yes. was she was high all the time or drunk all the time. And so, so I, I, I'm sorry to pause you, William, no but way. I got I got to say, and I, I, again, your um, being so candid is really so beautiful because I hope for our listeners and viewers, it unlocks the door to maybe some things that they have trouble uh, talking about. You had no one really to go to until the big confession. And you also had the Catholicism guilt on top of it, right? Oh. So, right. So let's talk about now that you know what you know, and if there happens to be someone who had a similar experience possibly, or is even going through it right now, mm -hmm. what would you say either to your younger self or even to someone who's in this situation? Um, how could they, how could you have navigated it better, um, better? I, I don't want to put any sort of like, you know, yeah. judgments on it, but looking with your perspective and your insights now, hmm. what do you wish you would have done? You didn't know any better, but now that you do, what could you have said to your younger self or someone who's going through something like this? The first thing I would want to tell them especially if they're a person of faith, is that God loves the fuck out of you. God, Jesus, Muhammad, you know, whatever your higher power spiritual being is, loves you for you. For everything that happened to you, for everything that will happen to you, your whole being, your, your soul loves you. Cares about you, you matter, you belong here where you are right now. The second thing that I would tell them, it is okay. It is okay. It's okay. Because you are a victim of people that knew what they were doing. You were a victim of pedophiles. You were a victim of people who are fucked up in the head you are okay because you're still here and you can get past it. It doesn't feel like it right now. It may not feel like that for a while. I'm still working through it. Like I'm still in therapy. I finally found a great therapist that I'm actually working through this stuff with, but do not think that there's something wrong with you because somebody else thought that it was okay to take advantage of you. So it's okay because you're okay. And I you love that, uh, William. Can I, I, I just feel like for anybody who's been through a trauma like this, or really there's, there's degrees of trauma. I'm sure this is a severe one, but uh, would you say, because I also go to therapy uh, and this is your show, not about you, not me today. But uh, I think a lot of people have trauma, some of it deep, Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I advocate for therapy, certainly, even if it's short term. And I, I love that CSUN offered it. Maybe your undergrad also yeah. did. Uh, but to, to reach out for help, I, I love that, William. Thank you so much for your wise yeah. words, can I say. So, um, oh, wow, man. Uh, so now let's, let's get through high school because I want to, there's just so much here. I wish this was a five hour show. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you are so awesome. This is so amazing. Uh, you were now, uh, let's say you, you were in high school and um, you said you were, that's where you found theater. Now, yeah. was that a surprise to you to, uh, or have you always had it? Cause you were said you were an outdoors kind of guy and you're into scouts mm -hmm. and now you found theater. Now, uh, were you surprised at that? Or did you feel like, no, this is a natural progression of. No, it definitely came sort of like a natural progression. So I, I took 
the drama one in seventh grade, and then you take drama two in eighth grade, and then I did drama three in ninth grade. And then they had drama as like an after school club where, where you would actually do like full productions, right? So by high school, I was finally, I was like, I made it. Um, and in ninth grade, you, you wrote your own play basically and then like you cast it and you did all like you know like the set design and costumes and so I was one of the leads in our ninth grade uh play it was called pranked um my name was Peter Falange I was like you know the the, the rich nerdy guy who everybody kind of like hated but like he had like a ton of money very very Sammamish for the, for the <laughs> so in 10th grade there was um drama club and then we also had an improv team and I joined improv and you kind of did like a couple of games and then you were invited if you were good um, onto the improv team. And so I made the improv team my, my sophomore year, which was like a huge win for me because I loved improv. It was- Is this uh, sports, fun. improv sports or something like that? Is that what it's called? I think that's what it is down in California, something yeah. like that. Um, and it was, it was so great because we met Mondays and Fridays and we would just practice and play games. Um, and, and I really finally felt like I was like part of this team. And I finally had people, you know, just like other, like, you know, juniors and seniors that like, excuse me, that I really looked up to and that I really felt like, you know, took me under their wings as members of, of drama and really began to like help develop my skills and like my interests. So it, I landed one of the lead roles in the spring musical of my sophomore year. I was Schroeder in You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. Uh, it was one of the best experiences of my life, being on stage, being in a, in a lead role. Um, we had uh, traditions that were eventually, one was eventually passed down to me. So like before a show, we had traditions that we would do. I ended up getting one, it was called The Shakedown. Oh, and it was like it was like, like a big deal to like get one of these traditions and so it was like I'm just so good <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to be validated isn't it it's great yeah, to say wow was. I have these these feelings inside me certainly you're bringing all of that to bear and whatever you can put up on stage and then and then for people to say you know what William you're good at this right. I you know validating you that's a cool feeling it was very validating. And, and as I kind of continued from sophomore into junior year, we, our productions were Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And then our spring show was Little Shop of Horrors. And so I wasn't a lead in either of these shows. I was more ensemble, but like I got to learn um, like stage combat and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And then for the ensemble with Little Shop of Horrors, I got, it was honestly like one of my favorite, favorite roles I've ever had. So I was in one of the, um, the musical was a little bit different than the actual movie, but I did um, Bernstein, Mrs. Luce, and Skip Snip. So it's an incredibly complex number where I do three costume changes, or I guess technically it's two costume changes, but I go through three different characters in the course of like three minutes. So you, you go out as wow. like you know, Bernstein and you're kind of you know, this um, you know, big business exec. Then I run off and I switch into Mrs. Luce. And so I then come out, you know, it says, oh my goodness gracious, oh dear, your Lord. Um, and then you're also like singing in that kind of voice. And oh then I go gosh. off, quick change. And then I come out and I'm like, you know, just like, see, skip, skip, got a guy. Uh, oh, how fun. And it was so much fun. Like, it was so cool. Um, this is but, amazing. Oh my God. Also, a, a learning moment. Thank God it happened in high school. Um, it was our... Uh, I start, as I'm singing Skip's lines, I ended up, I was re-singing Bernstein's lines. And I remember being like, oh. And the guy who was, who was playing Seymour, Connor, he looks at me and he's like, keep going, keep going. And I was like, and then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was definitely like, I remember like walking off stage being like, fuck. <laughs> made that mistake. Um, but also like, you know, what a learning moment to have because yeah, right. things happen where you just, you goof up. Um, but but that's, the, that's where the improv can come in too, right? Because you're like, okay, I got to figure this out on the fly and do it right now because the show is happening right now. And then, and then in my junior year, I was on the improv team and then our, our captains actually found an improv competition in Seattle. And so it was a high school competition. So we, we, we entered. We went, 
we did our performance and then we made it into like, like the final round. So it was like eight schools and we were then like one of four. So I'm not even kidding. One of like the highs of my high school experience. So we were like a team of, I want to say like 10, maybe 12 of us. And we cranked out game after game. Like you only get, I think like five to 10 minutes. And we just like cranked out game after like the whole audience. So it was roaring with laughter. We were like, like we, like we did it. And we were third out of like the four performances. Like we felt like really confident. But then the fourth group went, it was just four of them, and they were hysterical. Like, everybody is just- So what I like about this, William, is that you don't feel like, oh, we were robbed! No, they were oh, good, no, too. No. They were hysterical. <laughs> like, they were so funny. Like, they okay. did a great, great job. But then the announcer comes up, they pull out the envelope, and they're like, and the winners are, and, and none of us, you know, we were all, you know, kind of like you know, preparing to clap, Ah Snap Improv, which was our team. And all wow. of us were like, and so we like run up on stage. We're like, I can't believe, like they present us with like a trophy. They, they Oh my gosh. It was, it was such a high to think that we, no kidding. you know, we're gonna come in like second and then we came in first. And so it, it was definitely like one of the moments that I will never, ever forget. So William, I have to ask you then. Okay, so when you're getting out of high school, why did you, because I know we're going to get to college now. We're going to segue into college. Uh, when you went to Washington, Western Washington University, go Vikings. Um, when you went to Western Washington University, you did not major in theater. You there's, majored. There's a story there. Okay, I was hoping you would tell us. So now you're leaving high school and you're going to college. What's the story? So I actually ended up leaving college with, oh sorry, leaving high school with about two friends. So I used to have this really robust, big group of friends in high school. And in my junior year, so while it was, you know, I had like a lot of, a lot of highs, it was also one of like my greatest lows. So another trigger warning, um, attempt to commit suicide. So I was really struggling at home. It was a really difficult home life. And it, it had now like really began to affect me because of the sexual assault that I was undergoing. And it was junior year, AP US history. We were in the library, of course, always in the library. And we were working on our DBQ project, which is document-based like question. So it's like your cumulative project essentially for, for a push. And I was trying to say something to, to, my, to my group. And they were like, William, just let the smart people figure this out and just sit there. And I blew up. I was like, like, fuck you all, you all can go to hell. And I remember getting in my car, driving home. I ran up into my room, grabbed my pocket knife and a sock, and I hopped in my car and I just started driving around. And I was driving like, you know, just, I ended up back at Margaret Mead Elementary School. It was after school, no one was there. And I just like walked the, the school campus and I just wanted like my last memories on earth to be of a time where my sister wasn't an addict, where I wasn't being assaulted, where my family wasn't always, you know, screaming in a mess, where my friends weren't dick holes to me. I then drove to my church, which was also a place where Rick had assaulted me. And I went into the, to, to, into the grotto behind the church where there's a big statue of Mother Mary holding baby Jesus. And I used to sneak out of mass as a, as a kid and go and sit back there. And I put the knife to my wrist and I you know, was like saying my last kind of you know, little, little, little prayer to myself, last little you know, moment in the world. And I then remember just as I was saying like those prayers, it was almost like the floodgates had opened and I just start crying and I just start like sobbing now. And I end up falling off the stone bench cause I'm just like in like such a tight fetal position. Like my whole body is just shaking with, with sobs. And it was because I, I really didn't want to die. I really didn't want to die. I just wanted one fucking person to actually care. My family had basically abandoned me. My friends weren't there anymore because I wasn't this happy-go-lucky kid anymore. I was really fucked up. And I actually called the suicide hotline. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God that was on the back of my ASB card. And I, I remember calling and they just talked with me. And then I ended up meeting somebody at school later and they, you know, chatted with me. Um, and I, like my, at that time I was in like my, oh, I ended up actually driving back home and I woke my dad up because he was um, staying home that day. I don't think that he was like feeling very well. And I told him, I was like, dad, I just tried to commit suicide at Mary Queen of Peace. And he, I remember him being very, very calm. He's like, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Like, are you okay? I was like, yes, yes, yes. And he's like, great, we're gonna get you help. It's okay. So then they put me in with like a really good therapist, Dr. Hart, he was great. Um, and I saw him for like several years after, after high school and I think my first, second year of college and then we wrapped up our, our time together. But when I left high school, I was in a very low place. Didn't have any friends. I was still being assaulted. My sister was now out of the house, but she was now a full-fledged criminal. She was on Washington's Most Wanted. She was in and out of jail. She moved to Portland, caused crime there, moved to Vegas, worked as like a prostitute. Um, love. Uh, and so when I went to Western, it was a time for me to actually get away. I didn't major in theater because I took a drama 101 class or a theater 101 class and I didn't love it I just I just didn't love it it was it was interesting but it wasn't what I wanted to do I was sort of figuring out that this kid that I was in high school like while I love theater and like I love performance obviously it just it just wasn't resonating with me anymore and I knew that I, that I had always carried with me at a very young age, this sense of purpose, that I was meant to do something great with my life, that I was meant to, you know, make a real impact and like in a, in a real change in some way, shape or form. And not to say that you can't in theater, it just didn't feel that that was the purpose that I was placed on this earth to fulfill. And you and know what, so, William, uh, sorry to cut you off too, no. but a lot of people who fall in love with theater at an early age think, oh, this is it, I got to do this and there's nothing else. And they think of it as a failure if they don't stick with it. Why did, You just didn't try hard enough and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And uh, I love this because you're saying you're giving freedom, the words of freedom to anybody else who's had a great theater experience, but sometimes you can feel trapped in that. Like I, I have to do that or I'll die. And then you were coming to the realization that, nope, you know what, that's a great part of my story, yeah. but that doesn't mean I have to do that only. And Is that fair? To, yeah, and it didn't have to mean that I had to make that like my career because I kind of recognized that it was a hobby for me. It was something that I just- It was fun to do, right. To do. Right, but if, like, once you make it like your work, it then becomes your work. And for a lot of people, you know, they turn it into like a career because it's like their craft. It's like, like you know, it hits and uses all of their skill sets. But for me, I mean, I joined our uh, WW Glee Club. So as like an after school special, you know, I still got to perform. I still got to sing. I ended up being in a, a friend of mine's drag show. Um, uh, and that was like another like high moment in my college experience of one, just like being in like a drag show and getting, you know, to be just like, we were like the number that like closed the whole show. Well, like people loved it. Um, See, that's so fun. In my early years of Western, I jumped around. I went into Western wanting to be like a psych major. And then I did for like a hot quarter switch to theater. I was like, no, I should like totally pursue it. And then like I switched the following year back to, not the following year, like the following quarter back to psych. And then I took a communication course. And it was fundamentals of public speaking, right? And I fell in love with it. I just, I got to utilize all these skills that I had learned from drama, from theater. And I realized that I could turn that into a career, being a public speaker, being a keynote speaker, especially realizing all the things that I had from my trauma history, from my sister's trauma history, from my family story, right? I just had so much that I one day hoped to develop into 
you know, a keynote series or a book or like a true performance series that I would love, you know, to take and travel with when we're allowed to do that. Thanks, COVID. I know, um, right? Hey, I have to ask, I, you don't mind me pausing you. I have to ask you, you know, because of all the trauma you've been through, um, and I'm going to get to this maybe again when we get to performance ensemble, but do you feel like it's just given you such empathy for other human beings, especially people? You were saying that you're trying to think, I know I'm meant to do something, right? And that great thing that you're thinking of, uh, and this is for our audience too, it may just affect a small amount of people, but it might affect them profoundly. But the insights that you have, friend, give you amazing cred to speak into other people who are suffering. Would you say that's true? Very much so. And a lot of my friends, my close friends now, talk to me, and one of the adjective words that they use to describe me is, is vulnerable. They're like, William, you've always been a vulnerable person. You are an honest person and you never shy away from sharing like the deep, darkest parts of your, of your story, of your and life. Can I, and I would say, and I'm just meeting you for now, uh, but I would say your vulnerability from why, what I can ascertain from our conversation is also courage, my friend. What they're, what they're speaking about is your courage to be vulnerable. Is that true? Because I fully believe in the concept of kinesis, which is like the actual doing and changing of people through storytelling, through sharing our narratives. And so like, you know, I hope that for people listening today feel maybe just a little bit stronger or they feel a little bit more inspired or they feel a little less alone. I mean, I walked through life for almost a decade, right? Thinking that I was alone. And I also sat next to people who sat there and called me gay and a faggot and, you know, a cocksucker. And I couldn't turn to them and be like, actually it, like, yeah, you're right. Because a 50 year old thought that it was appropriate to, you know, shove his dick in my mouth. So correct. Yep. I am a cocksucker. You got it. Right. Um, but it, it really mattered to me as I learned that I have a very unique story to tell, that my story can actually do something and that it can actually impact people, hopefully for the better, right? I'm sure that there are people, you know, who listen, they're like, damn, you know, wish he had died because he's, a, you know, a huge homo gay. And it's like, well, well if they are sorry, thinking that, here. <laughs> yeah, if they are thinking that, don't watch this show anymore. <laughs> Fuck you. Because <laughs> that, you are not welcome here. Um, okay, so you, my friend, are now, uh, I'm just going to fast forward a little bit and go, okay, now you are end of your time at Washington, Western Washington University. Mm -hmm. And you decide, you know what? I'm not done with school. I got to oh, get me some more yeah. school. So I'm going to go to grad school, but not just grad school. Oh no, I'm going to Los Angeles, yep. which is, I mean, must have seemed like the other side of the world. Am I right? I mean, so why CSUN? How did you end up there for grad school? So in my senior year in my uh, capstone course, Communication Ethics, my teacher, Dr. James Fortney, told me, he was like, you need to go to grad school. And then my other mentor, um, Dr. Lee, she also said, she was like, you have to be a professor. She's like, that is like what you're meant to do. And so I was talking with uh, James a lot and he was like, you should go to Cal State Northridge. And I was like, <laughs> Northridge, what? Why? And he's like, because you will benefit a lot from studying under Dr. Stacy Holman Jones, who's one of the co creators, you know, one of the co founders of autoethnography, which, as we all know, is the methodology of using the self to understand culture and to be able to sort of take the lens and, and understand culture through the you know, storytelling of the self. And I was like, great, awesome. So I applied, I got accepted. Then Stacy went on a sabbatical for the year. And I was like, neat, all right, <laughs> hey, I guess I'll see you my year two. Then she decided to stay in Australia. And I was like, it's fine. But it, it honestly didn't matter because I had the pleasure, true pleasure of studying under Dr. Janine Minjay who I still believe is my mentor. Sorry, Janine, but you're always gonna be my mentor. And because of her, I met people like Fernando and I got involved in performance ensemble. And I felt for once that this was exactly what I want to do. Like this is exactly where I wanna be. This is, this is the actual doing and the telling and the creating of space for 
every single person, for every single story, for all of us to be, as a collective, hurt, but also as a collective working to fix that hurt, to mend so that, that. That's a great place, William, for us to segue into Act 3, which is Performance Ensemble, which I'm, you did Performance Ensemble all the years you were at CSUN, right? Yeah, the only, I sort of joined midway through my first, my first semester of my first year. Okay. Um, and the only reason was because they were in the performance ensemble room and I was in the, I was also a TA both years. And so I was in the TA office and they were like, I, we heard like mentions of like pizza. Um, so me and Z, we were like, we want pizza. <laughs> so we like went in and then Dr. Manjay, Janine, she was like, well, you can't just take pizza and leave. Like you have to stay for the meeting. And I was like, fine. <laughs> so then they were running through their uh, first show. Um, I don't remember the name. Fernando, do you remember what it was? It was like I Shadows know. in the it's, Dark, something like that. It's the, is it the ghost thing? It's not the ghost yeah, thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I forget what so it's called too. Janine, you know, was like, just like, you know, watch, you know, give notes at the end. So at the end, you know, Janine kind of opens up the floor and I don't know if Fernando remembers this, but I kind of just like start like ripping into it. I was just like, <laughs> first you're just here for the pizza. Now you're here to give it a critique. Right? Yeah, essentially. And I remember it being like, who the fuck is this guy telling us? Like, we've never seen this asshole before. And he's just telling us all these notes. Like, wow. Okay, William. And then I was also taking a class with Janine. Uh, it wasn't textual analysis. I think it was like uh, 603, like, almost kind of like the foundations for performance. Um, and then I just kind of kept coming back on every, every Tuesday night. And then I was trying to figure out, you know, like what, like what story do I want to tell and how do I want, like how do I want to be incorporated into the show? So I really was just like an ensemble member um, for that, that first show. But then going into our second semester was when we did was that la la land that was la la land uh, no i think that was hollywood bound i thought hollywood bound was our second year cuz that's when we did um sdsu i'm pretty sure la la land oh yeah you're right yeah yeah it, it was land. our so we, all of these titles sound so intriguing i wish i had seen also, them also we had la la land before the movie came out that was hard <laughs> <laughs> that was your, someone yeah. stole it so when you first got the performance ensemble what did you think of it i mean if, if, did you think uh, weird. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> did you think it was really weird? Because you have theater in your background, but this isn't theater. And I want to make sure not I'm a theater, theater guy. This is not theater. So yeah, why do you say it was weird? I, I, I think it was weird because I was going in with such a understanding that it was going to be just like theater and that it was going to be like a script and there was actors and there was, you know, like part one, part two, part three, right? And there was, you know, on and off scene. But then, you know, it was people, you know, like standing in like silhouettes. So, you know, people like, you know, like snapping and um, you know, people just moving around without saying anything at all. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> but then as I began to actually study it in 603 with Janine, and as I actually began to learn the, you know, origins of it began in oral interpretation. And then, you know, Conquer Good was like, just kidding. No, we're going to change it all up. Um, it, it all of a sudden like began to click that this is, it's totally different thing and that's what I liked more about it was because it wasn't just writing a script performing it I mean theater acting movies it all has has a place in our society in our culture but performance is special and it is a weird kind of special and I don't say weird with this like negative connotation it is weird to do it to see it to experience it but there is something so beautiful that only performance can actually accomplish. Well, you can't get it with your traditional acting, theater, you know, TV, movie-esque. There is something so beautiful about it's, it's only there for a moment and then it's, and it's gone, right? And then the performance is done, you wrap it up. <laughs> um, Oh, hey, Fernando. <laughs> hey, there's another, you've got another right, Fernando. Right, I'm sorry. No, I'm only doing that because I have to, like, walk out to do something quick, but I'm going to be... How dare you? Gonna stay on, so I want to do it on my phone. <laughs> that is hysterical. Ignore, ignore that. Wait, my, my doppelganger will be coming up in a second. So. <laughs> 
that was hysterical. Well timed too. Oh, that's because he was. Yeah. William was saying how weird uh, performance ensemble is. You, you see yourself. It's like you see yourself in the performances. Anyway, oh, so no. what I want to ask you then, <laughs> William, is, uh, and this seems, and tell me if you agree. This seems like with someone with your gifting of courage of vulnerability. Because performance ensemble, like you said, there is no script to hide behind, so to speak, yeah. like with theater. But now it's all you, baby. And it's really you as vulnerable as you can be. The more you of yourself, your vulnerable self you can bring, mm -hmm. the more powerful the performance for yourself and for the audience, right? Uh, would you say that you, because you have this gift of vulnerability, uh, was, it, was it easier or was it harder to access the the parts of you that you needed to get to? I would say sometimes it was easier because it was always easy to sort of pull, you know, an experience that I, you know, would want to extrapolate on or dive deeper into. But then what was the challenge was it wasn't just like writing a script and then just like reading it. It's like you also have to develop the performative aspects of it. And you have to think creatively. You're not just going to stand there and just deliver a monologue. Like, that's not what it is at all. And that was, I think, the, the beautiful challenge of performance is that, I mean, like, my, my uh, portion of La La Land was I had West Hollywood. So we de developed it off of um, Concrete and Dust, which was Dr. Min Jay's um, auto eth ethnography of Los Angeles. And so I was assigned West Hollywood. So I talked about body hair and how being, you know, like a hairy guy, how I tried to nair all the hair off of my chest and back in college and how I had just a terrible time. And it was awful and it was bad. It, it did not go well. Um, but it forces you though to also engage with your story differently. You can't just write it out and read it you also have to embody it again and you have to you know reactivate parts of yourself that you had either locked away hidden away that you don't necessarily feel comfortable accessing but for me it was also a beautiful cathartic experience of getting to re-engage with some of my past traumas um, and figure out that again like those things are okay it's not okay that they happened but i am okay i am i have come out on the other side you know i get to now be like an advocate for people that if these things have happened to you it's okay to talk about them and if people aren't listening then they're not the people that you should be talking about them with but there are people who want to listen to you there are people who can help you so i mean i went through five therapists before I found the therapist that I have now. Right? I'm glad you said that. Can I pause you again? Yeah. You're, everything you're saying, I feel like I could pause you and say this, but <laughs> yeah. as, a, as a veteran of therapy myself, that's another thing. Don't go to a therapist, if I may interject my journey too. Don't go to the first therapist and say, oh, that didn't work out. So I guess therapy is not for me. Correct. Uh, right, William? Because you, you have to go through some to see what's the right fit and don't give up. Don't get discouraged. But I'm just hopefully saying exactly what you're saying. I'm trying to paraphrase yeah, it in my no, exactly. awkward way. That uh, don't give up because there is a therapist for you and this process of finding who you are yeah. uh, and validating who you are. And like you said, not blaming yourself when it is not your fault. Uh, exactly. to find the kind of person that can help you access those things yeah. and tell yourself the truth uh, for my, and again, this is my uh, journey in therapy. Uh, uh, the negative voices would lie to you, oh, lie yeah. to me. And, the, and you buy those lies because it's easy to be hard on yourself. It's harder to just say, I'm going to be, I'm not that bad or whatever. I just love the way William, you articulated everything that way. Yeah. So um, now Fernando and I love to ask this question. I, I, I just got to pose it to you. Yeah. Um, for, for anybody who's watching this episode, uh, we ask this every week, um, what would you say to someone who is maybe not a comms major or, or not, uh, have never even heard of performance ensemble, but they're hearing about it now, maybe a friend's mm -hmm. telling them about this. Mm -hmm. And we know from what you've said, it can be challenging, it can be weird, but why would it be good? Why would it be good for, because I happen to believe this is true, but Oh, let me ask you this. Do you believe it would be helpful for undergrads and even grads to go through performance ensemble and why? If you are someone who has a growth mindset, if you're interested in growing yourself, performance is for you. And here's why. 
you're never going to grow in your comfort zone. You're never going to grow in moments of comfortability, but you will grow in moments of uncomfortability. And that is what I think performance forces both the performer and the audience to experience is moments of uncomfortability. Sometimes, whether it be decisions by the performance ensemble troupe or whether it be, you know, decisions by the audience, performance is uncomfortable, but in the most beautifully cool ways, you actually find yourself, like, I, there's just something to be said for, like, at, at the end of a show, you all are backstage, right? And there's just this electricity in the air that everybody experiences because you went out and you did something. Like you literally enacted kinesis. You changed people. And you also changed yourself. Like an audience doesn't walk out of a, a performance show being like, neat. <laughs> They're like, <laughs> holy shit, what did I just, what, what did I just right. experience? Like those, those moments as a performer, and you also don't have to be a great performer. Like there were I'm glad you people. said that. Yes, there were yes. Plenty of people that didn't have theater backgrounds, that didn't have performance backgrounds, like that me. also <laughs> came to performance out of sheer fear, right? <laughs> but 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 their stories are just as important. They hit with a wider audience actually than those of us, right, that do come from those types of backgrounds. And so anybody I think can benefit from the lessons that you can learn in performance, whether that be a performance course or just joining the after school performance ensemble. It's like there is something to be gained. And I also really do believe that that growth can really come from those moments where you're like, what am I doing? Why am I here? This is bad. Oh, I like it. Like you will find that by the end of that experience, you're like, it wasn't that hard. <laughs> well, there's a couple of things I just want to tag on that you said, William, that I think are really profound. One is, if you're watching, your story is important, as William said. Your story is important. We need to hear it. And secondly, uh, from my experience, uh, when I did it, everyone is so supportive. I mean, you're bringing uh, your vulnerable self, but so is everyone else. And yeah. it is a space where uh, Jade, who is our director, creates this oh, love space. Love Jade. <laughs> right? So it creates this space where it, it is non-judgmental. It's still challenging. I don't want to paint like this Pollyanna it's picture. It's not easy. Yeah. No, no, but it's so worthwhile because you're accessing uh, parts of your story that need to be voiced because as we're finding out with you, William, the more honest we can be with our story, the more it resonates with other people. So um, yeah, thank you for that. That yeah, is awesome. I, JD, real quick. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear me through my mask. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I walked out and I forgot my mask and I started freaking out, so I had to go back and get it. Okay. Um, but just like adding on to what you said, um, that show that Will was talking about where he did the piece on like his um, body hair and doing the thing on West Hollywood, I think was a semester where I was like having a freak out and I chose not to say a single word in that show. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was silent the entire time, but I was freaking out and like, I was just like going through things, right? But like seeing how Will was so um, comfortable and open about talking, sort of just like talking to himself, like through all these things that he experienced, right? Was an experience for me. And so like, that's something that eventually led me to, to be more comfortable about talking about trauma or just talking about things that were really just difficult in my life. And so, you know, if, if, uh, PE is something that you want to try or you're kind of scared I think it's worth doing it because then you also come across people like Will who sort of inspire you too you know right. and I should say for our audience PE we use shorthand sometimes in the show PE just means performance ensemble but uh, I love that you said that Fernando because yeah you, you could come as Will was saying just come as you are and you will be surprised how much you can not only benefit but how much you can contribute just by being present, by being there. Um, so that's fabulous. So, um, all right, so now let's let's segue. I could just see by the clock that we should try, probably should. I could spend five hours with you, Will, but let's, let's try to wrap this up. Did, did, uh, did Fernando tell you about the big three? 
the oh uh, no. Elements. <laughs> no. Well, then let's let's just see. this is actually going to be easy because <laughs> I here, are the, here are the big here are the big three. Okay. So for every guest, we usually ask if you have three things, and you can take one of three, two or three, or all three. Do you have a favorite joke or funny story that just makes you laugh? Do you have a favorite quote or some you know phrase that just oh man that just feels cool and uh, it inspires you or whatever makes you feel something? And number three, could you give us uh, maybe one, maybe a couple of songs, music that resonates with you and makes you just feel like wow that is touching my soul and that expresses something profound. Or it could be a dance song. I mean, it could be three favorite songs. How about that? So let's just, and you can say pass if you don't have anything. Do you have, number one, a, a favorite joke or a favorite funny thing that just makes you laugh? Yes. <laughs> Woo! Okay. So hopefully this isn't... Uh, we it, speak French here. <laughs> um, you already said motherfucker. I said fuck. <laughs> so... Okay. I haven't, I haven't said anything, you know. I know. Well, you're, you're the moral code, Fernando. I'm a good child. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm trying to say, William, is whatever it is, man, it's all right. Say it. Um, it, it cracks me up because it's about my mom. Um, and it literally happened yesterday. But it just brings like a smile to my face. So my mom is characteristically hilarious only because sometimes she'll say things or do things and you just have to be like, what? So when I'm not wearing glasses, I wear contacts. And so my mom and I were making a Costco trip yesterday and she like looks at me and she's like, where are your contacts? And I look at her and I was like, they're in my eyes? And she was like, no, I mean, uh, <laughs> she's like, where are your glasses? And I was like, I'm wearing <laughs> contacts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, moms, oh. <laughs> moms have that capacity, don't they? That is so funny. It's just, that is, that is Barbie. And that's typically, that is a great example of your mom and your relationship with her. That is a perfect her. example of my mother. Okay, she'll watch this and laugh right along with us, won't Probably, she? Probably, yes. <laughs> okay, good. All right, do you have, number two, do you have a favorite quote or uh, something along those lines? Yeah, I do. My quote actually comes from my teaching philosophy. So I, this was my teaching philosophy and will be my teaching philosophy forever. It is two words, be better. That's it. It's not be best. Screw you, Melania Trump. You stole it. You stole my idea. Well, kind of, but my idea is better. <laughs> the reason why I say be better is because yeah. it's not about a destination. It's about a journey. And you can always be better. You could be a better performer, be a better sibling, parent. You could be a better advocate. You could be a better plumber, garbage person. You could be a better friend, lover, partner. Because if you make it about the journey and you make it about always trying to move yourself forward, it doesn't matter what the destination is because it's always just about growing. It's all about growth. And if you make it about just continuously trying to improve and even like the smallest of ways, it doesn't have to be giant profound. As long as you're trying to be better, that is the goal. And that's where I told my students every single day, day one, that was it. But it really, I think, helped set them on a path of my, my professor isn't expecting me to be an A student. He just expects me to grow and to develop and to change. And that is exactly what I expect of every single human. People who have fixed mindsets, people who are just stuck, get unstuck, get unfit. <laughs> <laughs> what I love about Be Better, it's first of all, it's simple. And, uh, and the more you just mull it over in your head, the more profound it becomes. But secondly, it's a great anecdote, anecdote for perfectionism. Yep. So many people are stuck in, 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 and when they compare themselves, they compare themselves to other people. What you're saying, no, compare yourself to where you were yesterday and how you can be a little bit better versus if you try to either be a perfectionist or compare yourself to others, Mm -hmm. It's it's always going to be a losing proposition. You'll always feel terrible. But right. be better has this innate sense of, yeah, you're good, and you can be even more good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I love that. If you make it about being the best, 
you're never going to get there. You're always going to feel defeated because somebody else is going to come along that's a better dancer, better singer, better architect, better, you know, um, designer. And so why, why focus on everybody else when the only person that really matters in each of our lives is ourselves? If we focus on the self and we focus on our self-improvement, and we reflect and engage with ourselves and our stories and, you know, frankly, like, you know, our, our gaps, all of us have them. I am not a perfect person, but I also don't want to be. I want to be a person that is always changing, always growing. Because mm. if I think that I'm perfect or like I fully understand something, that's just foolish, number one. But two, it's kind of boring, right? If, if, if you're the best, life is boring and dull. I would much rather engage with things and continuously grow than be boring. Right. If you're growing, you're not going to be the best at it right away, no matter what it is. Correct. So yeah, if you're, all you're trying to do is be best at something, you will plateau and be done. And, and chances are you won't be best anyway. Exactly. So that's not even the truth. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. Like I say, though, I wrote it down because I want that. I, I love that. Uh, okay. So lastly, can you tell us uh, at least one, but say no more than three songs that resonate with you that you'd yeah. like to share. One song is called Easy by Troy Sivan. He's a queer musician. And I think the song touches on a really interesting concept, at least like how I interpret the music of like cheating and like cheating on your, your partner. Um, my second song that I'm going to plug is Rain On Me by Lady Gaga and Ariana Grande. It is the dance song of the century. Everybody should listen. It, like the music video is perfect. They are perfect. Um, but it just like gets me up out of my chair seat and I'm always on my feet bumping to it. My friend and I will like send Instagram videos back and forth of us just like lip syncing to it. Like no matter where we are, what we're doing. Um, so that's my number two. And then... My third one is uh, a song called, uh, oh my gosh, I'm now blinking on the, on the title. It's by the artist uh, Haim, H-A-I-M, um, and it's called Now I'm In It. It is, I've never had a song that I have played on repeat, just back to back to back more so than that song. It is incredible. I love it their voices and vocals just hit me like deep in my soul love um well i i can't wait to hear all the i've written them all down so I, well rain on me i already know and i love him by the way is it Haim or Haim? i can't remember but anyway oh, no. i, I know, know right <laughs> so dear listeners if you heard us pronounce it both ways now you can just hate on me i guess right. but or, or or in the comments below say here's how you <laughs> <laughs> phonetically please right. um, so uh this has been well william what a what a great experience man hanging out with you from la to washington oh state God, breaking the record too <laughs> for longest episode is it <laughs> I, I yeah but yeah. it should it, everything's gold in this so uh this has been dear listeners and viewers see sun performance ensemble presents a conversation with william bose uh my name is jefferson denham and my name is Fernando Martinez, who is being socially distant. Good man, good man. And so we want to uh, leave you with this quote from Irving Wallace, which we leave with, we basically quote it every week because it's so good. To be once, I think William will attest to this after listening to this uh, interview, to be one's self and unafraid whether right or wrong is more admirable than the easy cowardice of surrender to conformity. <laughs> so we are so glad that you tuned in with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Always aspire to be your best and most authentic self. Thank, Thank you. you to William Bose, and we will look forward to seeing you next time.